I really ought to just start it Go anyway ahead. before asking this. Um, anyway, welcome to another session of Regen Civics. Will, you just asked a question and you're going to talk about bringing another project in. So I'll pass it to you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for the last few weeks, I've been gathering information from the 13 projects that were voted in to this alliance uh, with, a, with an intention of finding out who is actually going to participate and uh, to, to, to make sure we have at least 13 projects. So the, um, the task got confirmation from 12 of the 13 projects. Uh, Mark Angelo from Valhalla has, has uh, confirmed that he's not participating and Valhalla is not participating in this incubator right now. Um, the 13th project that we can reveal that's that reiki has been talking about as the mystery project has been following this journey uh for, for, for quite a, a long time and is also part of the universal land trust um one of the alliance members of this organization it's a 105 hectare uh project at the foot of san pedro in lake atitlan um it's a regenerative uh project with 40 percent of the land being allocated for agroforestry and permaculture um, there's a nature reserve, um, there's area for community building, residential development, commercial development, um, and they have a very strong desire to participate in this incubator to integrate with the high for the go, um, and, and, and yeah, learn, learn from the, from the wisdom of this, of this group. So Reiki and I have been talking about, um, how to reveal the, the, the mystery 13th project and the invitation was to mention it today at the beginning of this call. So I wanted to hold space uh, for us as an alliance to decide whether this is the right move. Uh, we've, we've discovered that we only have 12 confirmed projects. So there is an opportunity for a 13th. Reich and I feel that this project in San Pedro would be a, a great addition. And we want to open it up to the rest of you guys to, to officially make that uh, the case so that we can vote in the 13th project and they can start participating moving forward anything else you want to add to this? is that a good enough summary um yeah maybe just a clarification i was asking to bring it up to talk about what we wanted to do to do for that 13th project not that i think this is a good project to put into it and let's just formalize that it was more do we even want to have a 13th project what process do you want to do that and if anyone had any strong opinions either way um, I think this could be fine, but there's been some other projects that have been following along this journey as well. Um, I think a lot of them are great. I'm, and this is a question that's going to come up as other projects are showing up right now. And they're saying like, hey, well, we didn't even know this was happening. You know, we want to be part of it right now. Um, so I'm feeling that quite often. Um, so that's why I don't want to say like, let's just put this one in because then I might have to sit here and say, okay, well, why does this one get in and all the other ones don't and all that stuff, you know, that everyone understands comes up. So that's why I was wondering if anyone had any strong opinions on how we could let Mark step out because he did say, hey, farm season got completely out of control here. So we want to pass our spot off to someone else who's more interested and has more time right now. Um, so we do have an opening for another project. So that's kind of what we were wanting to discover how to unfold. Um, Anders, you have your hand up. And then if there's any other quick things on this before we get going, otherwise we can also take this into Discord. Um, Anders. Yeah, I, I was just going to recommend that you do the same process that everybody else went through and just give us all. I don't know if it was hard to give us all like 100 points or whatever it is. And if, if three or four projects want to apply to come in, then they can do that. And then we can all spend a few minutes to like vote them in. And we can choose, choose it collectively. Are there any other projects that we know of that want to participate and want to be the 13th project? Uh, I know about four other ones that have reached out and asked. Uh, I don't know how many are serious right now. So maybe what we can do is we can give one week for projects to say, yeah, we would be interested. Um, then next session at the beginning of it, real quick, we can take five minutes for whoever's part of the alliance that shows up. So the project reps again, same as we did the first time. We can start off that call and pick who might fill the next spot. Does that work? And was that kind of what you're suggesting, Anders, if I repeated that back? Yeah. Um, cool. Well, Lauren, we'll Lauren's saying that if one round. Does anyone have a different idea? Oh, sorry, Will, I cut you off. Go. Yeah, yeah. Lauren was saying that we kind of did it 
th with 13 originally, knowing that someone might drop out, so we would end up with 12. So it's kind of, she's, I think she's saying that 12 is good and we don't necessarily need 13th. And I remember that, that was said in a previous call. So there is that idea that we just say, okay, there's 12 projects and we're working with 12. Um, and obviously what the Alliance says is, is what the Alliance says. But from my personal point of view, I'm, I'm, I am connected to this project and they're already aware of, of what we're doing and, and I feel that there would be a good fit. So I would like to put them forward as the 13th. And if people don't want that, then of course that's that. But I'd at least like to present it as an option. Um. Yeah, and my bias is to do 13 as well, just because then I don't have to go and update a bunch of articles and things again, changing 13 to 12. <laughs> or if nothing else, I'd like to keep that. Um, so if anyone has any blocks to this or has any other ideas, how we might pick that next project, just we could talk about it in Discord. Otherwise, we can show up to the next session. Any projects that want to be part of that 13th, you can put your name up on that list now. Uh, so projects that had applied before and maybe didn't make the cut, they can try again. Um, I think that could be fun for us to try to figure out who to put back into the next spot. Um, so we could start next session doing that. Um, any other things like this before we kick off today? Hello. Um, I'm just able to connect right now. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Laurent. So we, just, we were just talking about uh, you um and your project and how to uh potentially bring you in officially as the 13th and there's a few other projects that are also uh interested in in taking the last spot um so yeah for those of you that aren't aware this is loren this is the guy that's representing the 105 hectare project for san pedro um if there's any space for for loren to give like a two or three minute intro that would be great and i can also share his video in the discord but reiki over to you as facilitator um, maybe we can do this next session, um, or after if we know if they're part of the project. We start my video. And I also think there's a lag on both his and my side, so this might be problematic. All right, we'll work through the technical difficulties of this, but then for sure, let's try to find space to talk about that project if it's picked as being the 13th. Uh, otherwise, again, this is weird as a facilitator understanding how to field this when other projects are doing the same, and that's not necessarily what this space is for. But anyway, making sure I'm not cutting him off again, because <laughs> it's showing that he's talking right now and it doesn't look like it. Um, any other announcements before we get going today? And if we have time for this near the end of today's session, I would love to hear him if he wants to stay on and still share for anyone who's interested. Okay. Um, I also know Neil and Tucker, both of you might have prepared something on the legal side for today. If either one of you want to share that right now, could be a space to do so. Neil. Sure. Uh, this is on uh, cooperatives. So I'm just doing a quick screen share. And I'm going to provide the link of what everyone's looking at. So this is a project for Lala Gardens and our cooperative manager, Sid, Sid so you all know Sid, she is now living there and is um, essentially the, the primary staff person running the place along with Tina. Um, so if you haven't, if you didn't know that. Um, so this is a, um, this is about cooperative as a legal structure. That's what the focus is on. So I'm just gonna provide like a quick overview of like, um, so Lala Gardens, as far as participants are concerned, um, the cooperative is made up of owners. So we have two types of, own or three types of owners. There's two basic ones. There's the community owners and it's just a hundred dollars to become an owner. And then there's a hundred dollars to become a steward owner. Anybody can be a community owner. Um, just by paying $100. And you get to vote in two of the board directors. Um, to be a steward owner, we haven't figured this out yet, but like you have to be, you have to provide evidence that you're doing regenerative work, that you're dedicated and committed to uh, supporting and stewarding the, the Lala Gardens and that um, 
you know, you're live and active. So uh, once you're that, you can become a steward owner and you vote in all but two of the board directors. However many board directors, it's you're voting in all but two. Um, and then resident owners are basically community owners who choose to live there. Um, and they have certain other responsibilities and roles to go along with that. But um, they don't get to vote in any more of the board directors than the steward owners. So they're, they have the same voting rights as the community owners. Um, once you're a, a community owner, you are able to, and this is an example of a site where you can upvote, you can submit and upvote ideas um, that you feel you want to see. You can organize, we organize by experiences in building spaces and educational programs, outdoor features and products they want to see. And you can like these ideas and the ones that are most popular, then the steward owners or steward group or what have you will start to say which ones are feasible, which are regenerative, and let's actually start to finance and build these. And then at any time when these ideas start to become popular, people can actually start to have discussions in Discord about like, hey, let's start to do this now, regardless of having to wait for the ideas to hit a certain threshold or not. So going back to this, um, we also ha have, and to support the, uh, the cooperative structure um, memberships, which are tied to the NFTs. So you can either buy an NFT and get a, have a membership that way or become a member and, and gain an NFT that way. So that's it. As far as like revenue is concerned, the cooperative provides, the, the shares provide that $100 a, an owner uh, revenue. So you know, we, I'd, I'd love to get like 1,000 or 10,000 owners from around the world all being part of saying they're an owner, officially an owner, of Lala Gardens. And I think there's a certain a magical weight to that of having like a thousand or 10,000 people from around the world saying, I am an owner in this cooperative regenerative garden home living place in on this piece of land that I can visit and go to any of their events and educational programs and, and be a part of it. Um, we also just launched a, um, a main vest, a community loan. So you can actually community loan to the cooperative so that it can buy this property from the current owner, which is Tina. Um, and um, we also have the NFTs program, which you can buy um, these collectibles called Microbe Heroes. They actually have a more of this, a artistic stake in it. And if you'll notice also on the on the memberships, we were, we were looking to build in the five feature archetypes, which is what um, Seeds is, is uh, based on and which is what uh, the region civics program is somewhat based on and Haifa is ba based on, but it's the five archetypes that Anna Smith had designed as the basis for um, systems change. So that's very a uh, key component of like uh, how this cooperative is designed. Um, this is a loan program. So like when you contribute, um, you choose your interest rate and then you choose the payback period including one that's forgivable if you, you're okay with not being paid back. And as far as the governance, this is the part where we're combining the centralized world of governance, which is talk of things like boards and things, which you don't hear about in decentralized governance. But we're combining that with the decentralized world. So in the centralized world, we have the steward owners voting all but two directors and the clean owners voting, all, uh, voting in two. They vote in the board of directors. It's guided and shepherded by a steward circle of people who are um, truly uh, innately regenerative in terms of their work and their principles and values that make sure the board directors is being is being regenerative. And then they the board directors then guide the staff. And the staff is right now Sid and Tina. Um, and then as far as daily operations, we create a, uh, a decentralized self-organization system. Well, self-organization is decentralized. And the five circles, as you, it's recommended not to have more than five circles in sociocracy. And so the very fitting circles that we chose are um, the five archetypes, the five future archetypes. Um, and so just very quickly, systems builders are the, the ones that are developing the ecosystem of the whole DNA, like the people who build you know, the core of seeds and, and the tokenomics. There's a prototype builder to say, well, what's actually built on the land? The, what's actually being farmed? What are, how are these being regenerative? forming those prototypes. Community builders are basically the ones who build the community and support, make sure there's active discord and events and conversations going on, human development. And this is really about 
building up each person involved individually. And one thing that I'm really excited and proud of is that um, this, here's a, um, this is our wiki. Let me actually just put the wiki in, uh, in the uh, chat as well. Um, if I go to the steward circle, this is our steward circle of, of the people who are the wisdom council. And from here, we're gonna groom these people to become the future uh, board, but it is majority women, it is majority BIPOC, which is which basically Black Indigenous people of color, and it is uh, uh, one fourth uh, Indigenous and Native American. So it is very important that we actually start to groom. The current interim board is that does not reflect this, but because these people weren't trained, aren't ready yet to be board directors, so the interim board directors does not reflect it. It is majority women. It's just three board directors, myself, Leah Gibbons from the Regenerative Living Institute and Tina Trout. Um, but we want this to eventually reflect what we have here, which is a, is a majority uh, people of color uh, board. Um, but it is already a majority people of color advisory board. And this, we have been granted a grant to do a nine month training program in regenerative communications and conflict resolution. And it is called the Cooperative Governance Training Program that will start in September with 12 people who are being groomed to be the leaders of uh, this cooperative. So it's, it comes with cooperative governance training. Um, so that's it in a nutshell. Um, does anyone have any questions? This is the, oh, by the way, this is the website, allagardens.coop. Um, you have to be a co-op to actually get the .coop uh, domain name. And we have the owner section, you can literally become an owner right now today. Um, there's a member section. You can apply to be a, a resident, and you can also invest in uh, the project as a as a community loan. So those things are all set up right now. Um, any questions, um, Tucker? My question stems from like uh, more around like how the contribution accounting is going to work in a, a model like this. Um, because obviously you have people that like are going to be stewarding the land and living there and working there. And are they on a salary? Are they getting paid? How are you guys going to account for the contributions that they're making? And then how does that also tie in with this like standardized $100 share? Yeah. So the, the, the standardized, so it's, you know, it's got a centralized model to it and it's got a decentralized model to it just because in real estate in the U S there's certain legal requirements that are you just have to abide by because it's, it's managed by the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission. So in real estate in the U.S., you can't exit the system just yet. You still have to participate. So this is our way of, of, of participating in the existing governance system as a cooperative. Um, so that's just $100 as a one-time member. Steward owner is $100, but then $100, but then you actually have to qualify and be truly regenerative and participatory. As far as to the day-to-day, -day, this is why... We need Letty here to talk about, she's the, the designing, she's that archetype that's designing the, the, the system, the, the tokenomics, the, the currency. So we're definitely using a local currency. We're looking to use uh, the Haifa platform and developing the Lala coin. Um, she just started her two week vacation yesterday. So she's not here to talk about the tokenomics, but I'll have to defer to her as far as defining uh, an entire local currency and local economy for Walla Gardens, where we actually will be compensating people through this uh, new currency. And, you know, running the whole um, quests and volunteer programs and, and projects through just like uh, Seeds does through the uh, Haifa platform. Awesome. Did you have anything to add, by the way? Yeah, well, yeah. what we're trying to do is very similar to what we are trying to do, which is basically transition from single ownership into more of like a cooperative ownership model. Um, one of my, I did have like one more question before I dive into this so I can just better understand your model what are like the assurances for the landowner? I know there's like a, a loan, but it, it sounds to me like the cooperative is going to like own the property. So is she like granting the property 
into the ownership of the cooperative and then taking some sort of loan and is like what is that backed by and what were to happen if the cooperative defaulted on the loan yeah so i mean i'm going to say this imperfectly but it's she's agreeing to sell the cooperative at what um what the bank value is which is about 350,000 but it's worth about 800 but she's only going to ask for the co-op to, to buy it out for 700 so she's going to hold a $350,000 loan as she's going to become the bank on the cooperative for the remaining balance which is already going to be sold at below market value and then she's going to she's already said I'm going to be creative in how I want to hold that loan I'm not going to be like a bank and demand anything and this is you know we'll figure out creative ways to actually define what the bank is so that's something where we're you know kind of excited to play with um yeah I'm not sure that answers the question a little bit so the they're three hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the loan, and then is the other three hundred and fifty thousand in her equity still? Yeah, it just basically she becomes a bank holding three hundred fifty thousand dollars of um, a loan to the the cooperative owes her, and it's going to be paid back either to revenue or she's going to sponsor programs or, you know, it's it's uh, we're we're it's it's um. It's three hundred fifty thousand dollars that's going to be in her name versus a bank, and we feel much better about it, it being in her name than in a bank. And there's some, I guess there's some ideas for doing some of the tokenomics that are going to be sort of like um, backed by the equity, or somehow to start charting and tracking what the regenerative, um, what, what it you know what the value is that we're creating um, through regenerative systems that are going to utilize that equity as a, a kind of a pool. So I, I guess where I'm still confused is because I I'm hearing seven seven hundred thousand dollars for the value of the property, but I'm hearing a loan for three hundred fifty thousand. So where's the other half of it? Uh, is that in her equity? equity. It, it's like the the bank needs to buy out. I mean, the, 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 it's in foreclosure. It's going to be. It's in threat of being in foreclosure. So we're expediting everything, and so we need three hundred fifty thousand dollars immediately. So this is why we're going to get, we're going to do a personal loan. We're going to do a community loan. We're going to start selling shares. We're going to start selling memberships. We're going to start creating events, creating revenue, all basically to raise a 350 to buy the property initially, which is half the mar half the below market value. Um, and, and so we feel very confident we're going to get all those things well before the property forecloses. Um, and then from there, once we get that, we can breathe um, and take our time with the multiple different ways of creating revenue um, to pay off the loans and uh, um, the mortgage. Okay. Um, all right. I, I, I'm like kind of understanding it. There's still like some blanks, but I don't want to keep going back and forth about it. Um, I, if you would like, I could speak a little bit about the private entities. I know that's what you had asked me to do on this call. Um, and I can sort of like um, tie that yes, into I would love a that. model that I However, can we oh, let okay. there be a little bit more responses to what Neil shared? Cause it was a lot. Um, and then I'll pass it over to you in a sure. bit. Yeah. Uh, so does anyone else have any questions for Neil? On the, Anders. <laughs> Yeah, just just a piece of feedback, and we don't definitely don't need to get into it right now. But um, like, as these these landowners oftentimes might have huge hearts, you know, uh, they most likely do because they're like involved in this with us. I think it's just really important to somehow, some way, create business models that do offer them full market value of everything that it is, um, rather than you know, in some way or another, pay them less because the future ramifications of that, I think, is something to potentially consider if everything just doesn't go as as good as planned. So just just wanted to offer that piece. Can I plus yeah, Tina, I'm not sure you want to respond to that because if we're going to be putting debt to Tina anyway, why not make it the full 400,000 that it could and should be worth rather than three? I don't think we need to create because otherwise we're not being generative if we're being unfair to ourselves and kind of like balancing the pendulum to the other extreme. Um, So just backing up what you said, Anders, I agree. Yeah. 
it, it does feel better, to be honest, when I'm looking at myself from a <clears throat> landowning perspective. And because what my entire objective has been <clears throat> to kind of create templates for landowners to step into exactly this and for it to be um, like preferable, even, you know, it's a big piece to start for a landowner to even think about doing a cooperative and everything that involves. And so when we're creating these templates, um, I think that is interesting to look at the full value, but then, you know, it, and then as a regenerator, as a landowner, it be, then gives kind of um, more weight to, to trying out systems and models of using that, that piece, that, that equity to do regenerative projects, right? So like, it just means more money in the pot for us to be able to like act like a different kind of an entity um, where we're supporting projects that are regenerative and also backing the, the kind of um, regenerative value that we're producing. Yeah, the other side of it is also that if you have if a cooperative, if a group of people from a global group of people had to choose from any project around the world to, to, to choose from, they're going to pick one that where the landowner is willing to work with them on it. They're not going to pick one that's at highest retail value, right? It's just, it just doesn't make business sense to do it that way. So it's like, let's do something where the landowners are willing to actually contribute and let's work on this together. Not like I'm going to sell it my maximum property value um, and maximize my return on it. That's not, I mean, that's just not, that's just not what would be a good deal for a cooperative looking for the best project in the world. Well, from someone who wants to invest in it, it definitely makes more sense for me to invest in <laughs> under market value. So, you know, I understand that perspective as well. Um, so I just want to take a small detour and then we'll come back to Tucker because what you shared, Neil, about those archetypes, that's really important. Because uh, the video that we're about to have go out that introduces Regen Civics, what we're all up to and all the projects, there's going to be a sign up form at the end of it. So people are going to be able to come on here and be like, yep, I'm interested in joining one of the projects. Click here. It's going to show all 13 of the projects. They get to click on whatever one they want to join. Then we get to see, you know, if they're trying to become a full-time resident or not. <laughs> um, or if they're just trying to be part of whatever, what types of um, capital are they trying to bring? So this is one major question that we're asking. And the other major question, which I forgot to add to this one, is the, the five contribution types. So if you're saying you're wanting to join one of the projects or alliances to help them bring it to life, we're trying to channel folks into those five categories. So the ones that are actually trying to bring the Oring ideas to life. So whether you're constructing it or physically building it, or whether you're holding the space for bringing people together and designing the organization, et cetera. So we'll get more into these five archetypes later, but I did just wanna you know, parrot what Neil brought here, because this is really a powerful model for us to be able to scale how we grow here. So as people show up, they're like, this is a lot, this is really intense. We could try to simplify it dramatically how we can try to help people find the right places for them to show up. And then what we're hoping to get here after this gets shared out is then a, a mailing list of people who are very targeted with who they're looking to join. And then we can start giving that to the projects and alliance organizations, and you can start reaching out to people to join your projects, of course, right? Um, so letting you all know that's coming and for us to start thinking this way as we step into designing our organizations, which starts next episode. Um, and maybe at the end of this one, we'll start getting into those roles and actually designing what our games look like so we can start bringing people in to help us, right? Um, so Neil, thank you for bringing that. I, I love your model and how you put it together. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Neil or anyone from your team want to share anything else before we move on to Tucker? Uh, this is Jillian. Neil, I thought it was great. Um, are you at liberty to share the link to the Miro board? No, it's the first thing I shared. Okay, I switched over to my computer to see it better, oh. and I must have lost it back on my phone. If you wouldn't mind, uh, yeah, I'll need to go back and repost I got it. it right here. I just also sure shared enough. a wiki. And I also Thanks. just shared a link to a wiki page for the future, five future archetypes, so it's just super clear what they are. Yeah, and every time I've looked at them and felt into them, it feels good, but it doesn't feel fully complete to me, and I haven't spent enough time with it to really tell. But as we look at 
these being the main pathways or channels for how people get involved or understand, I think we need to stay awake with the throughput to see whether those five baskets hold everything we need and want. And I just wanted to speak to that. Yeah, well, I agree. Our group agrees. We Everything is meant to be adaptive, emerging, you know, evolving. So yeah, nothing's finite. I mean, wow. for me, I take it as a proposal. There's obviously good thinking that went into it um, by the woman who developed it and whoever helped her. And as we live into it, let's stay open to it, continue to evolve. So to expand on that then, because yes, fully agree. Um, I was using the five and they're kind of like the, the initial filter. They're absolutely not the final role set. I mean, just for, you know, putting an anchor out there, I think a, a minimum viable role set for an economy might be around like 144 roles, um, certainly not five. So the five are kind of just like channels to help direct people. Um, and I was using those five when you're looking to join one of the alliance organizations versus one of the projects themselves. That's how I was originally doing it. Um, and then for joining the project, we look at the seven forms of, well, rather nine forms of capital. So if you come here to say, I wanna join a project, that's when you'll show, okay, here's all the different forms of capital. So that's the other kind of way of channeling it into seven streams this time, but it still helps us understand where people might fit into our economy. And are they helping to bring one of these different forms, right? Um, and also helps us start more balanced so another one of the things we've talked about is we'll have people apply and be like, yes, we want to be part of this. And then we can help make sure each, you know, minimum viable startup society has the right number of roles from the right area of categories, right? So as we start having people and we make sure that we have the diverse enough skill sets we need for that economy to survive and have the most, you guys get it all. Um, so yeah, so this is one framework is this nine forms of capital. The other framework is those five you know, role archetypes. I think the other framework that we're developing right now is that minimum viable regenerative economy. So again, I think this might be like 140 roles that we're gonna identify as we start having projects succeed. We'll start seeing roles that are really helpful across many projects. Then as we start identifying those, we'll start building up what that minimum role set is to start offering the next generations of projects. Um, so that's kind of how I see it unfolding. This is a multi, generational journey, of course. Um, so yeah, thank you for bringing it all in. Um, I'll pause here in case, again, there's anything else left for Neil or what he shared or what's been shared up until now that you guys want to bring in before we go on. Awesome. Then I'll say thanks, Neil, for sharing all that. I've got all your links and you guys are great. Uh, we'll look forward to having Letty share a little bit more when she gets back from vacation. Um, okay, Tucker, we'll send it over to you. And to give some context, this is groups showing up and discussing what their legal and org model is and how it all comes together. Because I know we didn't really yeah. show it. And let's before. keep practicing that celebration. That's a lot of really high quality work and we can just have that beat, that moment of good job, really good. Look forward to spending time with it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> Can everybody hear me okay before I get started here? Good? Yeah. Take it away. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to try to do my best to tie together the conversation we just had about cooperatives and this ongoing conversation we've been having about private entities. Um, I just want a small disclaimer here that there might be a slight difference in opinion on my end, and that's totally okay. We're just coming from a little bit of a different perspective here. So the biggest thing about private entities uh, is our ability to choose our jurisdiction um, for any sort of disputes that we're going to handle within the organization. Uh, when we choose uh like an LLC or an LCA or one of these more governmental entities, we're automatically agreeing to jurisdiction of their court system. And when it comes to the ownership and sovereignty of land, I find this to be very important um, because we all know how messy those court systems can get. And in the worst case scenario of 
something happening and, and there being some sort of dispute, we would really like um, the, the, the first thing to happen to be like our own internal predetermined uh, dispute process and governance process for how we're gonna handle things. And in terms of like transitioning land from single ownership into cooperative ownership, it's really important that that landowner has some assurances that, you know, that if this project doesn't succeed, their land and their equity will still be safe. And that, you know, should the project succeed, that the land will be safe for long, long past their life. Now, I totally understand the use of the LCA for having a bunch of people come together and pool resources together and, and, and crowd pool and, and raise money legally uh, in terms of like the SEC and the IRS and all that. But when we talk about holding uh, the note or like holding the equity or a loan for the property for the LCA, it starts to get a little bit sticky there. And like, I know right now at the outset, at the beginning of a project, you know, everyone's, you know, clear eyed and, and happy and joyful and excited to get this going. And we're just going to figure it out. But the, the bottom line is like when stuff goes wrong, emotions come out and, and stuff gets sticky. And if we don't like kind of have a predetermined way to like handle things and protect the land and e everyone's equity and stuff, it, it can get very messy. And with a land trust, um, with, with a private land trust, there's already this like perfect equity accounting system for, for how we would kind of handle that, um, handle the loan, handle any existing equity and any, anybody that any investors that wanted to come in and contribute and become exchangers. Um, we could all handle all of that internally in a private entity in a private trust. Um, and we can also set up, uh, what's called a trust protector, which would be somebody that Christina would assign to basically oversee the board of directors or the trustees, uh, and just to like ensure that her vision is is being carried through. And in the event that uh, the LCA were to default on the loan or something, the trust protector has like kind of uh, overarching authority to kind of step in and, um, you know, if if that's what's needed, sell the property so that. Christina could get her equity or um, transfer the property back into ownership for Christina or something of that nature. And so what I see here is like a perfect opportunity of like what I've been talking about this whole time, which is like the merging of these two types of entities, the private and the public. And I, I see a, a very, I see it to be very important to keep the ownership of the land in the private and keep it sovereign from the government and from everything else, and then use these public entities for what they were designed for, which is for interacting with the public and with commerce and raising money and stuff of that nature. Um, so I don't, I don't have like a full presentation or Miro board or whatever that uh, Neil had, but I just want to stress this, I, this, this concept of private entities and public entities and kind of finding a way to merge them together into something that works precisely for what we're trying to do um, with more assurances, more safety and, and more sovereignty for the land, which is really the most important thing. So I'm gonna leave it there. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Um from a facilitator point of view and holding space here, I don't think we ever have to start a disclaimer off if you have a different point of view. Um, that's exactly what we're trying to hold here in this space. Um, also, I don't think it would be helpful, not saying this was occurring, for us to ever try to find the one path to rule them all. Um, because I think in this journey towards systemic regeneration, we're gonna need to take multiple approaches um, to be able to cast that wet net wide enough um, to be able to see this systemic change happen. So I do know that we're going to need to take multiple different divergent, sometimes conflicting journeys at the same time. So we're kind of more like a brewery here where we're brewing a whole bunch of different flavors of new civilizations and ways to get there, um, rather than just trying to pick one flavor to kind of be the best. So I just would like that to be the, the meta container here.
So we're never trying to debate over which one is better. We're just exploring diversity, you know, and choosing for ourselves, of course, which model is best for us. Um, so setting that field. Um, with that being said, I would love to say, nope, I'm not going to respond. Um, I'll just hold space in case there's anyone else who wants to respond to Tucker and anything he brought. Will, go for it. I just want to say thank you, Tucker. It was very well articulated. And I feel um, in, in alignment with your point of view that private jurisdiction is very important. And obviously, I agree with Reiki too, that this is a meta the container and everyone is free to choose the, the path that's best for them. And, and exploring and experimenting is great because then we have diversity. But the song in my head is, uh, the, or in my heart, is the spirit bird. And the spirit bird sings that the government hand can take our land and still they can and still they can and still they can. And still they will be able to with La La Gardens, uh, with a cooperative that's under state regulation. So that's just the one sticking point for me. Um, but everything that you've shared and the way you've presented it, I love it. And you could easily do that without SEC regulation in private jurisdiction. There's, there's nothing stopping you from, from exploring that too. So thank you, Tucker, for, for raising the awareness to that. And yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Rocky. I want to add one perspective from a, a, well, a terrible country that also a lot of indigenous communities has even better uh, legal advantages and in I don't know in English what's name the reservations I guess is similar in the states uh, but actually there's something that is much more legitimate but at the same time much more fragile in countries like here like the violence itself like there's a lot of places in, in Colombia where you can find indigenous reservations where the government the government will never get to that places but still a lot of the violence will be the their their law so so just to put into into the perspective that the the law that the laws that give us some advantages are the same system that is taken out not necessarily legally but the same thinking the extractive extractivist or violent so there's something that is more legitimate that is our own agreements no matter if they are legal or not so yeah just to point that out definitely there's a, a whole lot of power and i think that's a big part of the journey here is making our own agreements and saying like hey as sovereign beings coming together to design a new society. We want to design what agreements we're showing up with here and not be, you know, hamstringed by previous agreements. So I definitely see a, you know, whole frontier of possibility open up there. Um, thanks everyone for bringing that. That was great. So does anyone else have anything else to share to Tucker specifically before we keep going about what he shared? Yeah, I just want to <clears throat> iterate, like, it's always been my intention to have this um, land be protected into legacy as a natural farm, and um, that requires succession. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, and even though it was, has always been my intention, it's like, I'm being challenged to go back and look at the covenants agreements to make sure there is some kind of verbiage in there. And so I would welcome anyone's feedback or input on how to how to make that a course of action and um, what that exactly looks like. So thanks Tucker for bringing it up. Yeah, and Tina, I'd love to go over some of that stuff with you if, if that's something you want to do with me. Yes, please. Cool. Magic. Ooh. So awesome seeing all these projects evolve so quickly. Um. Okay, anything else on legal at all that anyone wants to bring in now before I kind of shift gears for us for the last half of today? I'll be bringing something up. Okay, well, let me know then when you can see my screen.
Not yet. Still not. Okay. Well, this will pop up at some point. This is our mirror board that I've been putting together. So I'll just share a link to it. And then you can explore it yourselves. There you are. And then if you open it up yourself, we're over on the right side where it says claims and disclaimers. Either way, to close up on our legal side, I think the biggest thing is just being clear with people who are inviting in to play the game with what we're doing and what to expect. So if you are a legal entity that's public, you know, and you have legal claims, say so. Make sure that, of course, you're getting all the licenses and permits and you're applying for what you need to apply for and then use that appropriate disclaimer, right? Um, if there are no claims, there's no other claims or you're joining a private system that has certain claims, but only in that jurisdiction, then again, just say so. So this is just the very basic stuff to wrap up legal is just be very clear, you know, what types of claims that people are going to be getting. Um, and then going forward on our platform where we're representing projects, we're actually going to have tags. Um, this might take us a little while, but we'll get there. I'm um, talking about what major claims you can expect with particular tokens. So if one token has a legal claim that's backing land, that's going to be a different type of token that doesn't have a legal claim for a piece of land, right? Um, then you could talk about the legal claims, like I said, the digital claims. So if your token represents something digitally for your project, then say so. Again, maybe this token can be traded for other tokens. That's a digital claim, right? And then any cultural claims. So if your token can be redeemed for food at your project or a stay or access to any of your events, et cetera, that's a claim that they get from the cultural side. So this kind of wraps up legal is that if you're being really clear what your token represents, what people can expect from it, what rights they get, they can sue you or not, et cetera. <laughs> you know, that's just what we want to have right there front and center. Um, there are some, and I can share them, that are just regular templates that a lot of token projects have used for like some of the more deeper disclaimers that just say you take no responsibility or liability if you want to use that. And you can just copy some out there. Um, yeah, so I'll pause here. The, the biggest thing, again, is that just be clear to people who are buying your token what they can expect when they buy that token. Um, and as long as we're doing that, I think we're going to try to avoid most of the problems that could come from that. Um, any questions on that before I carry forward? Okay. So then where are we at on our journey? Um, we just talked about the make it legal part. And a lot of this is recursive. So this might actually be going back and having you guys rethink your economic models. Um, actually, I have two hands up, so let's do those hands first. So, Robert. Yeah, thanks, Reiki. Uh, I was just wondering why you're showing this um, disclaimers. Uh, are there any use case or any cases that you learned from already? Is this coming from feedback or how, how did you come to the to form these claims. To form the types of claims? Or mm -hmm. this is just a, all of this is just maps. These are different frameworks for helping us think about this. Um, so really you just want to let mm -hmm. people know what they can expect when they buy your token. What can they claim with that token? What does that token give them? You know, if it doesn't give them anything, then just say so. There's no claims, right? or you might have some different types of claims. So this is, it might be an incomplete map. Um, this is just a, a built map with my own experience over the last decade of what I think is a clear way of just articulating how to use these tokens. But the big meta thing I'm trying to, you know, distill here is just be clear and upfront with what people can expect with your token and we can avoid a lot of problems. Because, you know, if we talk about a land back token, but there is actually no legal or cultural claim or anything, you know, for accessing land, then is it a land back token? No. So you need to make sure right up front, there's no claim for this token. It's just speculative, you know? Or again, if you go through, you get it. Maybe you get it. Do you get it? <laughs> or do you want me to keep explaining? Yeah. No, it's okay. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. 
Yeah, so all this is, again, it's just a simplified map for us to be able to articulate to people what can they expect when they buy our token and what does that mean? Um, whether that token's an NFT, you know, or otherwise it doesn't matter. It's just what are, if people are giving you money in any capacity, what can they expect, right? Because that's where all, you know, legal disputes come from is someone comes in and enters into a relationship and they didn't have the full information or whatever it was, they feel like they've been wronged and now they want to go get a lawyer and go seek, you know, retribution or whatever it is. So that a lot of times just comes from unclear communication up front. So if you could be really clear with people as they're showing up, what they're you know getting themselves into, then we could avoid a lot of that conflict down the road. That's all I'm trying to articulate here. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on our journey is we're in the make it legal and we're just going over that. So this might have impacted our new economic model designs, maybe not. Um, so now we're gonna move more into the building it if necessary. So we're gonna go through the process of actually designing what our organizations look like. I have a small map here. Um, what our tokens do and start kind of getting this map set up so people can understand where they can fit into our organization. Let me just dive into this then a tiny bit. Can you guys see the screen or no? Can you see it now? All right. Well, then again, you could follow the link and show up. Right now, we're in the area where it says a do based coordination ecosystem. I'm going to take us over to one of these. These are just examples of each one of our projects. So I'm calling them a do, you can call them a DAO, a project, whatever. Each one of these four concentric circles represents one of them. So then how we interact with other projects is through the, our tokens. So when people you know, earn our token in our project, they can go to an exchange and sell it for another project's token. And that's kind of how you move from one project to another project. It's through the central exchange through tokens. So this is where we have kind of our market-placed economy where everything is, everything is fungible. It's all kind of the same. There's no relationship there. A token is a token, right? or unless it's a non-fungible token, but in which case it's all for markets. So you'll be able to trade from one organization to another. So again, this is how you exit and enter your organization and enter another one. And then as you get into that organization, you might then start establishing roles. You might say, we don't wanna to use tokens within our organization. We don't want everyone to have to market themselves and say, you know, yes, I'll give you medical services, but you've gotta pay me a hundred tokens for every hour I'm giving you services. You know, maybe we don't want to do that. So that's where the role economy will come in, where someone could say, hey, I'm a medical professional. I'm going to give health services to the community. That's just my role. And then I'll give it to anyone who's a member who needs help. And then you're not using tokens anymore to intermediate that economy. You start using roles to do it. All right. So I give some examples of, you know, when to use a market-based economy versus a role-based economy, just to help us start thinking about this. You know, but marketplace economies work best when both supply and demand are both good things. Actually, I have a better picture of this because this is a really powerful concept, I think. So what I mean by that, as I bring up this other picture here, is that if you're setting up a marketplace for something, you want both the supply of that market and the demand of that market to both be good things, both be things that you want. Because in any business, its job is to make sure that demand always exists and that they're meeting the supply. That's the basic form of a business, right? Because where you get you know, perverse incentives is for example, in healthcare, where there's an incentive for there to be sick people, which is the demand for the healthcare, right? And that's where all the conspiracy theories start from with us poisoning the world is that there's very powerful groups who have an incentive to do so, right? If that incentive didn't exist, it'd be really hard to, you know, paint that story, but it does exist, right? So, you know, they even put out this, the whole report recently is, is it profitable to end or to actually heal people? Sorry. 
were just hearing my baby cry a little bit and it traded me off but then my wife took care so if i'm feeling a little bit nervous right now because baby screams just kind of set me off so i'm feeling like <laughs> a little bit tense so bear with me um, and the same thing with security. So warfare, for example, the demand is angry people, supply being arms and weapons, et cetera. So you never want you know, security to be a marketplace need. So this is really something to think about because it's like, where do we want to put markets? Where do we want it so that supply and demand are what's fueling us meeting our needs? Because in this case, you always want there to be sick people. You don't want to get rid of sick people. So then you don't have an incentive to have a society full of healthy people. Instead, you have an incentive to have a society full of sick people addicted to your medicine, making you a lot of money, right? So as we start going about designing our economies, I'm you know, only going over this so much because markets are how we're kind of thought to design economies from, but I'm urging us to think about designing economies from a different perspective. And that's where the role-based economies then come in. Um, I was trying to convey a really big idea in a small amount of time. <laughs> so I'm wondering if that made sense at all, if we're following and if I can keep going deeper or if we wanna spend a little bit more time on the difference between a market-based economy versus a role-based economy. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say something here, Reiki, in, in that you're absolutely right. This is a huge idea. This is a radical departure from what people are used to. And even though I don't necessarily think that you have to spend more time explaining it, I do want to emphasize that this is this is really hard for people to get their mind around if they're embedded in the typical market kind of way of looking at the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to try this from a different lens then for five minutes, and then we'll open it back up for conversation if my screen will allow me to share. Okay, do we all see the presentation here that says game guides? Uh, mine says it's still loading on my screen. Okay. We'll just give this a moment then to show up. Oh, there we go. I see it. All right. So I'm going to try to simplify this a little bit more. Um, I'm using the analogy game a lot more. And in the introduction video, you'll see this. But it's we want to simplify it down to that. I think this would be a, a massive success for our alliance, is if we can make joining any one of these projects as fun as you know opening up a new game board and playing with our friends, right? So I think that's ultimately what we're kind of creating here is a game-like environment where people get to show up, you know, understand what their role is, how do you go around the board, you know, how do you make moves, how do you contribute, how do you play this game, just how do you be a member of this game and achieve your outcomes, right? So the same logic that we use for playing games, we can apply to setting up our projects and our micro economies here, right? Um, so you might have this game here, you know, length infinite, you know, players, maybe you need 144 players for this minimum viable economy. I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so in the box, you know, what's in there? You might have a regenerative economic system. So that's something we've been working on in SEEDS and in the wider communities that we've been a part of is we've been designing these new types of economies. That's what each one of our project essentially is, is a new type of economic system. And then within your project, you might have a bunch of different roles that people who want to come and join your project are going to be able to embody and step into. You might have a bunch of different currencies. So you might have a different currency for every type of capital, for example, maybe, maybe not. You know, you might have a whole bunch of different governance systems that people can step into and have them designed. You have conflict resolution protocols that people can step into if they have conflict or whatever it is, right? Um, so this is what our starter kit is and it's the game guide and it's what we've been working on. So let me explain this a little bit more. So this is the game guide that we've been running through. We were just talking about legal structure. At the beginning of this season, we were talking about the patterns of co-creation, economics, and all that fun stuff. And we will come back to that. 
Um, the vision, values, image, you know, what's in the game, what are you creating? Most of that you guys already had. So that's where all the projects kind of started. So we started our journey here and then we kind of got up to legal structures. And now we're moving into this, how do we structure ourselves? So I'm kind of shifting us from thinking economically that like macro designing of our economies now down to the micro, like from the perspective of somebody showing up to the project, how does this impact them? How can they best show up and start supporting the project and whatever's happening right now? So that's where uh, quests will come in, where you get to set up bounties, you know, do X, get Y. And that's something that anyone in your community can show up and start contributing in simple ways, right? Or roles and all this stuff. So I'll pause here in case there's any thoughts or questions before I keep going. And is this a more helpful way of explaining where we're at and where we're going? All right, I'll, I'll keep going and we'll see if this makes full sense then. Um, and then of course, after we figure out our structure, that's when we go to crowd pooling. So that's when we come in and say, this is our structure. Now people can fill those roles and now we're looking for land, et cetera. And then we'll get into the governance process after that. So this is where we really dive into different ways of making decisions, doing sense making, different ways of voting, if you're voting at all, all that stuff. Um, so that's a huge conversation that'll keep going. Um, so again, this is where we're at, where we're going. Um, let's get into this a little bit more. So Neil at the start of this, he showed his minimum viable kind of project economy. He had five circles. Um, here's eight circles, so a little bit more, um, but it's a similar concept. So this is the, the idea here is, is this is us creating a circular heuristic and microeconomic system. Because it's always that chicken and the egg question with people about transitioning to a new economy. It's like, oh yeah, well, I'll use this new token, but how do I you know, pay for food or how do I get housing or whatever? So you actually need to have all of humans' basic needs met within your microeconomy in order for people to fully step into it and engage with it. So that's what we're trying to do here with creating these microeconomic systems is have each one of our main needs, pull up a little needs pyramid here, very basic stuff. Like let's make sure each one of our needs are met by a circle. So as people show up, they can get all the way to self-actualization and thriving within this microeconomy without having to, you know, interface outside of it. So this is where we get to the minimum number of players that we actually need is in order to have all of these circles staffed, of course, that's me saying it's not just our needs, it's Earth needs, um, different type of economies. I can run through this real quick, actually. No, nope, never mind. I'll do this next week. I'll just hint to this. We'll talk about the different types of economic systems that each circles can employ. And of course, these are just examples. I mean, I'll give you four different types of examples that are on a spectrum, but there's an infinite number of ways that we can make decisions and coordinate together, right? Um, this just helps us start thinking about how we can do that. Um, so each circle will have a different way of making decisions and going about meeting needs for the project. Yeah, watch out for free markets. All right, there we go. So this is what we'll come to before we get to our crowd pooling event, is we're going to need to figure out how many players we need at a minimum before we can say we're ready to start the game. So it depends on how many needs you're trying to meet as a project. If you're gonna say we're trying to meet all members needs, you're probably gonna need more players to show up before you can meet that promise than if you're just trying to meet the need for housing, for example, or just housing and events or whatever it is. So this is what we'll wanna identify. Personally, I'm really interested in this idea of minimum viable economy, is we're saying we're having enough players so that all people's basic needs are met. And that kind of looks like this, you know, so you have enough people that are meeting all the needs across the spectrum. Then when you show up to this new economy, you're all supporting each other and all your needs are met, right? Uh, so I could just touch on these, you know, real quick to help plan an idea. And again, I can dive more into this next week. But what's the difference with living water circle? So water circle today, the organizations that are responsible for helping us meet water and a free market it actually makes more sense for them to pollute our rivers and streams and creeks, et cetera, pollute free water and bottle up water somewhere else or filter it or provide some type of service of cleaning water and sell it on the open market. That's the best way to make money today in a market economy for providing water. There's literally no incentive for businesses to go out there and make rivers drinkable again. There's no way for them to recoup an investment, do that work, right? 
So that's a fundamental breakdown in our economies, right? We say it's actually better to pollute our water and bottle up water somewhere else and sell it back to people than it is to make that water drinkable again. But we want to kind of fix this. So we can say in our economy, we're saying the water circle, they're responsible for making our living water and our creeks drinkable again. We might have access to a whole watershed. We might have springs on our property that need to be maintained or cleaned up. Maybe we have a spring near our bioregion that used to exist. And with a little bit of effort, we can actually revitalize it and bring it back to life. You know, so that's the types of things that Water Circle starts thinking about because they're getting paid to meet the need of water. Now the incentives change. If they can have everyone's need for water being met free and abundantly, there's very little that they have to do in order to keep getting you know, paid for providing water for everyone. So now the incentives are completely reversed. Instead of people being dependent on you providing constant water in a market economy, now you want people to be self, you know, you want people to be independent and sovereign and meeting their own need for water so you don't have to do very much and you can still get paid. You know, So that's a different way of looking at a role-based economy. Then they show up and their job is to go and clean creeks. Same thing with, you know, nourishing air and breath. Their job would be to plant all the species that are going to clean the air and maybe species that will have, you know, beautiful fragrances blowing through the village. And they're very thoughtful about what types of species are going to put what pollen out there to have what flavors, et cetera, in the air. You know, now you actually have a circle thinking about that. How can we make our air more livable and breathable in our communities? You know, we don't even have that in our economies. So what do we have in our economy? Every freaking city I go to, the air is full of poison and stinks, you know? <laughs> Where are the places in our world where economies are making the air beautiful and nourishing and, you know, fun to smell? So you kind of get this idea. So the food circle over here, their concept is the same. They want to make the whole place an abundant food forest where food is free and abundant and they don't have to do very much work for it. So now their incentive is to go and plant out food forests, opposed to their incentive being you know, have their farm where they're growing food, where they ship it to a restaurant, where they make money, you know, selling it to chefs, etc. In a market economy, you want people to be dependent on you for food. You don't want them to be independent. Otherwise, you know, the demand and customers dry up. But in a role-based economy where your role is just feeding everyone, do it the most effective way possible. Now, again, you want to set up systems where people can be food independent and not have to depend on you. So if we can set up a minimal viable economy where everyone's full filling roles with this logic in mind to meet the need from everyone else in the economy, so the need for food, water, habitat, et cetera, then we can have a minimal viable economy where people can step into it and step out of the old system, have all of their needs met and be able to fully you know, embody this culture that we're creating. Um, so I'll pause here at this concept and idea because it's something right at the threshold of what we're doing and designing. I want to see how this lands, get any feedback from it before I actually record this presentation. Uh, Stephen. Um, you are muted, my good sir. Yeah, I was just saying this is one of my favorite uh Chinese characters, it plays into your conversation about a role-based economy. You see here, it's the a concept of harmony. And basically, you see the character for a tree and the character for a mouse. And harmony is that time when all things are nourished and all, all needs are met. And why this particular set of characters, the tree and the mouse, well, a tree breathes out carbon dioxide and breathes in uh, and and uh, uh, breathes out oxygen, breathes in carbon dioxide. Human beings breathe out carbon dioxide, breathe in oxygen. It's a system in harmony. When you have a role-based economy, you go that route, it permits people to start working from their purpose and what their gifts are that they contribute to humanity rather than being in an open market where they have to compete. And so th this is a gigantic concept that you're laying out here that if humanity can get it, it will lead to the regenerational activity-based system that we're trying to create. So. I just want to applaud you for laying this out because I think this is a key 
to the whole thing. Well, thank you. And um, again, my role is just map making. So it's all of us putting this map together right now. I feel like we've all kind of contributed to distilling it down to something that just seems so simple <laughs> on one perspective, but uh, so encompassing of all the different breakthroughs that we've all been a part of bringing to this up until now. Um, so yeah, thanks for that, Stephen. And thanks for being part of this journey. It's been years. Um, Roberto and then Julian. Yeah, maybe I can go quickly first because then maybe Roberto can riff and weave in something I'm going to say because it's something we've talked about a little bit. Is in permaculture, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that we don't teach functions very well. And so rather than looking at these as roles, I, I at least at this stage, somewhat prefer to look at them as functions because then functions can be performed by a number of different roles. Though roles may be a more accessible way of, of speaking to it, but roles and functions are very much intertwined, but they're not necessarily always the same thing. But what are the functions that we would like the system to perform? So I just want to throw that in there. And really, we're getting at holistic regenerative permaculture design. And the, a fundamental permaculture in the old way of teaching it is you want to have a diversity of ways to meet a need or a function in a system. Right. And so we should be looking at a diversity of ways in which these functions get fulfilled. And there's going to be a diversity of role, inhabitation, et cetera. 10 million percent. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Each one of these, um, I'm calling them a circle. So a function, I think that's synonymous. And we can probably switch that out and say the same. Um, so each one of these had three different people talking about multiple roles existing in each one of these core circles. Um, but I actually like that. And I like folding that over as we look at our ecosystem map. We say, OK, what are the functions we want this ecosystem economy to serve? And then let's have a circle for each one of those functions. And then within that circle, all the roles are thinking up multiple ways to make sure that function is met. So as humans, as the integral beings that we are, we show up into each one of these functions and we say, okay, it's really important for us to have living water met from a number of ways. So we're gonna work on the creek, but we're also gonna be capturing and cleaning rainwater and we're gonna be slowing and sinking water into ponds, et cetera. They're doing all the things for living water in the system. But we just now have a circle for roles to show up and exist where they provide that function for the ecosystem without having to you know, create a market incentive to do it, which comes with a whole crap load of waste. You know, in the market economy, there's this huge you know, excess bloat of advertisement, which advertisement is essentially manufacturing needs for the supply of whatever you're creating. You know, so people aren't showing up saying we have a need, we have, a, we have to meet this need. And that's how it works in a role-based economy. In a role-based economy, real needs come up and then circles figure out how to meet those needs first. There is no need then for advertising to come in and you know, tell people what their needs are and what new needs they might have. Why in a marketplace economy for like warfare, for example, there's security companies that they wanna go around and they have to create the need for their security. So there's an incentive for them to create conflict, you know, spread fear, spread violence, et cetera. So it shouldn't surprise us but a lot of our media is being dominated by these massive industries that have an incentive to spread fear and violence, et cetera. So that's why we wanna move out of markets for those things we don't want and into roles. But I say that, and I understand the time, so I'll start closing this up actually. Let me take us over to our mirror board because roles are just the next step. And don't forget about Roberto. Because I jumped the queue in front of him. Oh, that's right. We're going to end with Roberto then, um, right after I share this, because it might lead in. Um, roles are the last point in that fungible area. So our tokens are actually fungible. So are kind of roles. And that's the idea with roles, too, is that multiple souls, people who are non-fungible, so everyone's unique and very special in our own self, we can fill multiple roles. So an organization can be staffed and say, we have 20 roles. And 20 different people can be filling the roles at any different time. So those types of economies exist here where everything's kind of interchangeable. Here, tokens are interchangeable. Here, you know, people are interchangeable. 
But when you move deeper into your economy and into your systems, those are no longer a case. Because for you to have a knowing based economy where you understand fully who somebody is, who their gift is, how they're showing up, how they fit into the whole, that's very much dependent on the person, not necessarily the role anymore. But roles help us get there. But they don't scale as well. So that's kind of the, you know, the, the dance we're in all the time is this fungible side helps us scale and helps us connect with the global world, but it's less personal. But when we get more personal, more relationship, we get deeper into our you know, unfolding of who we're meant to be, deeper into authentic community and magic and all that fun stuff. Um, so I wanna bring that up because this is a progression. We're not trying to get stuck in roles because uh, that could also hold us back from moving into more advanced economies that are predicated on other types of relationships. Um, so I'll stop there and I will pass it to Roberto for thoughts and we'll open it up for any questions before we end for today. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the question, okay, so the focus would be mainly between uh, the tokens and, and the roles. That's what we're going to mainly focus about. I really like the uh, the example that you give, uh, that you gave and um, specifically the water and the fountain, you know, let's just get, let's get the water. So in there, I, I thought this kind of format, the target would be to, uh, address any kind of small town that has all of uh, the people already there and maybe they're struggling economically there is a, a need for looking at an alternative system and i think that that's really fertile ground for indeed kind of installing this game and uh, i could uh, could totally see workshops going into little towns and just saying hey you could actually do it yourself right and uh, and and work on uh, using this kind of rule set and this kind of uh, economic system. So, yeah, uh, I really like what uh, I really like where this is going. <laughs> this is going. So, thanks a lot for that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we'll definitely have that global pool of players who are showing up to play the game um, that are going to be, you know, coming in from outside to join projects. But I personally think a huge component of each one of our projects is extending that game to the local economy, it's extending the invitation. We're not colonizing anything here. And of course, that actually brings governance into where they start evolving it as well. And if there is a difference between you and them anyway. Um, so I think that's a huge piece, definitely, to start involving the bioregion that we're a part of, because that's how we actually can start taking over the watershed. We can't clean up all of our springs again unless we have the whole watershed. And we only have the whole watershed if we involve all the local communities around. But then we can share that vision. You know, We have the vision of having drinkable rivers in our watershed again. That's a really powerful vision. People want to get behind that. Then great. Then we can set up these you know, micro economies that include our whole watershed to start cleaning up our water within our region. And then we start saying, look, we don't have to wait for you know, nation states or companies or whatever to give us permission to regenerate we can start creating that regenerative impact right now in our own local communities and our own games. And then our projects are just the nodes that take that and hold space for that happening and hopefully extending out, right? So I think part of our ongoing journey here as projects will be taking this game and helping other projects get set up, but then of course, taking this to the communities that we're a part of. Um, so yeah, Roberto, thank you for bringing that. Um, I know we're super over time, but does anyone have any more thoughts? Oh, I see one from Felipe, and then we'll have one more question or thought before we close for today. Yes, thank you very much. Well, again, uh, I guess this is a, a cultural difference in in these countries. We have a lot of these social organizations. We, we just have different names and, and methodologies. But basically, the the communitarian councils or committees, or well, all these other aspects that are already going on on many of the, at least in the countries that I know, are are what are supposed to be the ministries in in the governments and how they really plug in the different pieces because some some might have a more local knowledge, but there are others that would have like more transversal knowledge that has to be shared and get to the local from one point to another no matter how so the 
the really um, the, the whole ecosystem perspective means that the information should be flowing and for that we do need like these maps or root routes that creates the, the, the flowing of the information very efficient and for that for sure we need these kind of maps that, that put together the that, that intrinsic relations that one aspect of life could be related to I just I could I can only point one one example like if we need uh, to build health systems or health uh, holistic centers we also need architectures that actually understand what health needs or we also need uh, the economies so it, at some point is how we facilitate and um, yeah create those those frameworks for for the information really gets to the to to the correspondent need or or desire well of course uh you're designing a lot of those frameworks to help groups go through exactly that process right well yes. the answer is yes <laughs> so um so for projects that are wanting to dive deeper into that, definitely, I feel like reach out to Felipe, but also um, there's a few others that you saw, uh, Neil, for example, with Regen Living. So this is how we're setting up a diversity of alliance organizations that are helping projects go through this process of designing a holistic economy. Because it is a, it is a process and we don't know the best process for this yet, which is why we have lots of organizations showing up in the alliance to meet this need so that we can start exploring it from a couple different perspectives and of course have a library of games you know ideally we have you know a couple hundred different main varieties of the game of setting up a new regenerative economy with a bunch of different flavors different cultural biases some different contexts involved with them etc so that when communities show up they can pick which one is most aligned to them and unlikely have to create something new but i think that's only going to come once we have maybe a few hundred different you know choices for people otherwise just like we've seen in this first round of 13 projects every one of the economies i'm talking to they're they're wildly different you know there's some similarities between them but they all have like something they're really strong about that no other project has so and this is just with the 13 when we were most aligned so i think this is going to continually be the pay the kind of the reality because the biggest similarity i've found is that every project, what makes them unique is the process of that community coming together to meet their own unique needs in their own unique way. So because that's like one of the main principles of creating a regenerative economy is that it is the co-creation of the people involved in it, then by design, you're gonna have a whole bunch of different, you know, um, projects and how those things manifest. So that is to say that diversity is what we're creating, and there's some different templates to help people understand how to create that diversity. And there's some organizations to help people and projects go through that process, i.e. the two you saw today was Regen Living and Gaia Union um, that Felipe keeps talking about. So if you're interested in all that stuff, then reach out to those guys and dive deeper in that beautiful world. Um, okay, we're getting to the end of today. Does anyone else have anything they want to share or bring I know we have one more thing out here. I'm sure of it. Lauren, do you have anything on your mind? Just happy to be here. Thanks for all the great work. And I'm, again, I'm just, uh, we're all super excited that Nadim is going to be working with uh, Walter and the team at Finca Sagrada. So super happy. Great work, everybody. Ooh, Anders, thank you, Lauren. And thank you for everything you guys are doing. I mean, I think a Sagrada is going to be an awesome showcase, especially bringing in the Kogi and kind of getting their wisdom for how to set up an economy and what roles like they think, you know, economies might need. Like, I think that's going to hugely impact our design you know, process here. So uh, awesome stuff. Um, Anders, Claire. 
Uh, I'm curious, uh, sometimes I don't have time to go through all the different threads in our Discord and as, as active as some of it is, it's, it's really, really a little bit overwhelming for me. And I want to make sure that I just like stay up to date on the most important needs and requests in order to like move our collective project forward. So is there one of the threads specifically that like is most important for like us to follow or like is there a way for me to make sure that I'm staying up to date with put, uh, any potential requests or needs that are like up to date that are required now? Awesome question. Thanks for asking. If you can see, this is our Discord here. Um, we have season one co-creation where I tag project stewards, which you're a part of. Um, that's the place where I put in things for you know season one, what we're creating here, different tasks or whatever for project stewards and alliances as well. Um, so yeah, right here would be the channel that I'd say keep most up to date with. We have the season one episodes that I always put the season episodes in. Um, if I feel like they're worth sharing, sometimes I don't. And then announcements is just the general channel to keep up to date with. So if those are the three channels that you kept up with in your own channel as well, um, would probably be the everything for you um, outside of any interest in that you'd want to be part of. So that probably applies to everyone here is you each have your own alliance channels or your project channel, keep up to date with those. And then if you're part of season one, keep up to date with that channel if you want. Um, but a lot of it is still me keep going through these weeks, condensing all of this into that huge deck that you just saw. I'll be presenting that into, you know, I'm going to try to keep it not too long. Um, but I'm hoping it's a really simple explanation of what we're trying to undertake here. And then we can take that and bring it to some new alliance partners that we've been talking with. They can understand who we are. And then we actually build out our potential for season one. Um, so I thought that we might actually be rushing through and getting to a crowdfunding this year. Um, and maybe we still might, and especially if there's more interest in the projects to do that, we can still do that this year. Um, but we might be doing it at the beginning of next year and doing it a little bit more, you know, solidly and concrete and having more hype built up behind it. Um, cause I think if we do this appropriately, we could be talking, you know, tens of millions that could be coming into this to kick it off rather than you know, maybe not that if we kind of grassroots kind of run with this at the hip. Um, that's all to say also that my brain's a little bit scattered these days, having just become a father. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, I want to slow down and make sure that we're doing this right and appropriate as well. So I've almost finished that presentation talking about what all the Alliance members are bringing. So it helps us get a full understanding of who everyone is in the ecosystem, what we're actually trying to accomplish here. And then I'll start sharing that and we'll start getting more people to show up and help fill roles. So from the project's perspective, what's really important for you guys right now immediately is start thinking up the roles that you need to help you today. So these are likely roles that are around designing your project, you know, fulfilling requests from region civics or whatever it is, like helping you design your economies. You probably need help in that domain if you don't, fine. Um, but then start designing the roles you need right now. So when we share this video and people start coming in, we can filter them to you and we can start growing our projects. Um, and then of course, if we're doing contribution accounting, then they're just earning tokens in your project for showing up and filling roles right now, unless you have some other means to pay them. Um, yeah. I think that's everything for now. Does anyone else have any other questions or thoughts? I just want to make sure we're complete here before we close. I, I just want to say, uh, Reiki, that many of us are very familiar with the dilemma of fatherhood. So we're totally sympathetic. <laughs> Thank you. And it's a fantastic one. I mean, going through, you know, the birth of Deep this yoga. The birth of a human, it's a, a beautiful centropy to come together at the same time. Sorry, Jillian, if I, and if I, well. I think there was a request, an ask of whether you shared the deck from what you had just shared in the latter part of the call. Reiki, did you put that in the chat? Sure, uh, I could do that. But I'd also just say probably watch the video. The deck might make sense to you, but it probably needs my explanation to fully get it. Um, there are a lot of speaker notes that you can dive deep for probably a while, and it's just random ideas that I needed to put together. So again, if that makes sense to you, great. Um, otherwise, wait for the recording. But yeah, it's in the chat now and it'll be in the show notes. Yeah, I'd like I'd like to see the actual 
I'd like to see the actual deck. Um, Me too. That's there in the chat. Awesome, everyone. Well, then Thanks. please feel free to unmute yourself, say goodbye, and I'll see you in Discord next week. Yeah. Thanks a lot again. Bye, Actually, guys. Actually, Robert, could you stick Thank around you. for a second? Thank you.